as meaning and topology. And so I'm, that's what I learned as a graduate student, what this means geometrically. So in some sense, I could think about the Navier-Stokes equation as a topologist, okay? Now, and uh, some of the, many of the details will be at Ruth's talk, but I wanted to sort of just quickly, although I don't remember what I was gonna do in detail because that young lady in the pink erased <laughs> my notes. But I wanted to show you how topology itself arose from differential equations largely. Our equations, first there were algebraic equations and there were differential equations and topology just was a natural evolution. So it's very natural to finally take the ideas of topology and try to put them back, pay back, you know, to differential equations and make approximations and uh, that you can put on computers that might be more natural because they're related to the structure of space via topology. And topology is certainly in the structure of the equation because you can write it in this way that I said. So, so the first thing was, I can see it's not erased. The first thing was, I'll actually do this exactly. Suppose you have one cubic equation and you have another cubic equation, okay? You put the two equations together and what do you get? Somebody shout out the answer. You mean how many solutions? What? The question, how many solutions are there? Yeah, I put the two equations together and what are the solutions? No. It's a zero dimensional set consisting of nine points, okay? And it's the intersection of the two and, and each individual equation. No, now of course it, over the reals, if I moved this up slightly, there would be less, right? But over the complexes, there's still nine. That's called Bezu's theorem. And these were studied all through the 1800s. I see, she just erased it so I can still. <laughs> I'm going to have fun with this. <laughs> anyway, she, okay, so, uh, and over the complexes, this is a stable result. There's still nine points, sometimes with multiplicities, but you know, it's always nine. Okay. Now, there's something topological about this. It's nine, 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 nine. No matter, you move these equations around, you get nine solutions. Okay, so that's the that's already the beginning of a lot of algebraic topology because these individual things are really, if you work in homogeneous cubics and in, in take homogeneous solutions, these are in projective space. These will be surfaces. They're one complex dimensional guys, so they're surfaces and they're closed surfaces, and and these surfaces will intersect in this four manifold, the complex projective plane. And so this is a lot of geometry and topology already here. And this is all studied through the 1800s. Then, uh, and earlier, I mean, you know, cubics equations were studied, Cardano and 15 something, right? And whatever, right? So then uh, in the early and middle 1800s, okay. Middle 1800s. So, there were these things called abelian differentials like bz over z. You could integrate that along some path starting somewhere. As long as you didn't go through the origin, then you get some other value and you could vary this. And if you move the path slightly, you would get the same value by integrating along the path, right? And then you get this function of z. And what is this function of z? Is that a function? It's a function of z. You have to say log z. Oh. <laughs> right? I mean, log z, right? And then if you put more complicated things here, you would get other functions, right? And as long as you path didn't go through 
the singularity on the denominator, you would get some interesting functions, right? Elliptic integrals and things like that, right? So there's two ideas here that uh, you see the reason you get the same values if you went around back and then back, this closed curve bounds this thing here and you have some kind of Stokes theorem. And when you write Stokes theorem out, you get zero on one side. So you get the, this integral minus this integral equals zero. Yeah, yeah, as long as long as the yeah, this I'm assuming this path when I moved it, it didn't go through the origin through the singularity, right? And if you're doing an integral that had lots of singularities, <clears throat> then your path would have to avoid the singularities. And if you move the path slightly, avoiding the singularities, you would get a well defined thing. And then you get very interesting functions. In fact, usually all the functions that we know names of. Many of them are hypergeometric Bessel functions, stuff like that. Are elliptic functions, theta functions? They're all they're all like made of integrals like this, right? So, and this deformation right here property is related to. In this case, this is what's called an abelian differential, and in this case, this is a non-abelian differential because the, you know. The paths are more complicated. You know, it's not abelian anymore. Okay, so this was, you know, abelian differentials, etc. Now, the person who, one of the persons who thought about it universally was Poincare, uh, and and as a young person, see, and uh, he was like forty around nineteen hundred, so. Uh, 30, uh, 30, a little over 40. Uh, he also considered integrating, solving second order and higher order differential equations where you've got, you, if the second order differential equation of a linear second order differential equation, you, if, if you have that equation, you're trying to solve it with phi, if you know the first derivative and, and the value, you could compute these two terms, the first order term and the constant term, and you can compute the second order term. And so then you know what the second derivative is, as long as the coefficient is non-zero. The coefficient is zero, then you can't solve for it. So those are like forbidden points. But then if your path, if you start somewhere with two numbers, Z1 and Z2, for the value of the function and the value of the first derivative, then you can start solving it along the path and get this function. And it'll be, it'll depend on the, it'll depend on if you move the path slightly without crossing the zeros of the highest order term, it'll get, you get the same answer here, like the logarithm, right? So these are uh, what Poincaré was doing as a young person and started naming them. There was a Euclidean function and all sorts of other functions. And then he uh, he was also doing algebraic geometry. Uh, oh, I left off Riemann here. Riemann, Riemann actually studied these 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 integrals on a a Riemann surface around pass, and there were the number of holes is called the genus. And in this case, there would be two interesting holomorphic differentials up to linear combinations that you could perform integrals on. And he used those and made some interesting co-function theory. And then because he had uh, consumption, it died at 39, Riemann, has 10 papers. Each one starts a field. His collected works are this big. Anyway, he died at 39, he had consumption. And uh, he would go to Italy and he worked with Betty in Italy. And he told Betty about the first Betty, what we now call the first Betty number, which is twice the genus, which is because you have two circles for each hole going around. That's the first Betty number. And so there were these higher Betty numbers. And Prakare, of course, knew about all this. And uh, he invented. Generalized the idea of Betty numbers or homology class. Oh, so Betty worked, they started cutting out 
they considered open regions in three space and higher space cutting out things. And then if you cut like a point out of three space, you have a wrapping number of a two sphere around the point. Instead of a winding number around a point in the plane, you would have a wrapping number, right? Or if you move the line, it would be a winding number around the line. So they could get the same winding, wrapping, et cetera, effects in all dimensions. So they could talk about Betty numbers and all dimensions. The number of linearly independent intervals is the way they talked about it. So this, so Poincaré would to find this for manifolds, and then he proved the Poincaré duality theorem that the faith Betty number for a closed D manifold is equal to the D minus faith Betty number manifold oriented with the Poincaré duality. And, uh, and then he really made a formal definition of homology. So he formally defined what these cycles were, and then uh, they're in duality because a K cycle has to intersect a D minus K cycle in a certain number of points, non-zero number of points. If each one is non, where well, there's a pairing between cycles here and cycles here, given by this intersection. And there was also torsion homology classes. And he also made a linking duality. This is particularly interesting in odd dimensional manifold because it's related in the Navier Stokes equation, the curl, you know, there's a U and a tau, and then there was this one variable in the middle called the curl of U. The curl of U is exactly an operator that studies all of the linking between one cycles and three space. That's the curl. So, so somehow, and then this, you know, we still have to say what this whole thing was, but this, this is sort of the other equation. You can add a linear term to get the non stokes equation. It's just that big Okay, so, so Poincaré kind of started topology uh, and he also was using, so that was sort of from his algebraic equations. It was easier to generalize this, but in dimension one, he had these ordinary differential equations and the idea of multi-valued functions by integrating ordinary differential equations. And, you know, a, a third thing he was doing was the three body problem. Uh, and, uh, he was, you can't write formulas for the solutions. And he invented the idea of quantitative dynamical systems, which I learned about when I first met David out in Berkeley 50 years ago. No, 54 years ago, 55 years ago. Huh? When did you meet Jeff out there? Uh, Maybe you knew Jeff already. Jeff at college. Yeah, I know, but how long? Oh, never mind. We were out there 55 years ago. Uh, in the early 60s. You, okay, so yeah, right. Between 60 and 64. Right, but I want to say when we all three met. Oh, all three? That's, Probably in Berkeley. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Yeah, that would have been 67. Yeah, right. In 55 years ago. So now I was learning in Berkeley. I was new to this stuff, but I was also learning this, hearing about Frank Array's work on qualitative dynamical systems. So that's what one, one topic going on in Berkeley. Okay, but anyway, getting back to this, and then he defined, he also defined the fundamental group. So he discussed homology because of algebraic equations. He defined the fundamental group, it used to be called the Poincaré group, uh, because of these paths solving the multi, solving these the differential equations and getting these multi-value solutions. So when you do a second order equation, you come around a closed path, the two initial conditions come back to some other vector of two complex numbers. And so there's a matrix that takes that vector to that vector. And then when you go around a path, and they go around another path, these matrices compose. So you've got a homomorphism into the matrices. And then you can take nth order differential equation, get n matrices. So he defined the fundamental group to be the universal group of substitutions for a ODE, which was had this nice deformation property. That was his definition of the fundamental group. Okay, so this was 
definitely an ODE. Actually, I have a paper where I actually prove that his definition equals to the current one, just to check. You take L2 of a group and that's your Hilbert space, you write down the system. Okay. All right, so we have Parker-A. And then there's one more thing and I'll be done and Ruth can start, okay? One more thing is, okay, now this is homology in the fundamental group uh, and qualitative dynamics and, you know, differential equations all rolled into one. And uh, now you've all heard of cohomology, right? But what the hell is cohomology? So cohomology was invented by, um, in, in, in the West anyway, by Hassler Whitney. I once as a graduate student, you know, I'm not shy. So I went over to Whitney's house and knocked on the door on a Saturday morning <laughs> and said, I knew what a picture of homology, I don't want to tell the story. All right. <laughs> so Whitney invented vector bundles. They had the tangent bundle because of, general relativity and around Einstein's time and differential geometry. And Riemann also invented the differential geometry, right? Besides doing this stuff we were doing here. And they had that, that was the tangent bundle. And then Whitney noticed, well, submanifolds have normal bundles and there are other bundles around. So he invented bundles and then he wanted to know whether a given family of vector spaces could have a continuously varying non-zero vector because it was known on the sphere, the continuously varying tangent space does not have a non-zero vector continuously, the hairy ball theorem, right? So, and then it turns out it was obstructed and the obstructions lived in a certain functions on the cells of the space, like one for each thing here on the floor, a number say, or something. And it turned out that you could, if you didn't give up, if you got an obstruction, you'd backed up and tried to change your previous construction and go forward again, the function changed in a certain way. And then the quotient was actually, uh, first of all, the function satisfied an identity and you could change them by some functions. And anyway, the quotient group was where the real obstruction lived and that's called cohomology. Okay, so he invented cohomology and, they, and then there was this conference General Conference in Topology in 1935. So this is around 19 to 30s. And he showed this wonderful fact that uh, there's a universal vector bundle, like all the K planes in a huge Euclidean space, all the K planes, that Grassmannian has a bundle over it, which is for each K plane, you take the vector space, which is the K plane, and that's the universal bundle. In other words, any other bundle over any space can be, can be thought of as restricting that universal bundle to a, a subspace, pulling it back to the space. So, so topology maps and up to homotopy and homology and all that. And now we've had this cohomology of Whitney, which are these obstructions. And then there was this conference in, in Moscow in 1935. So here's Moscow. And a couple of Russians came to the conference, Omogorov and Alexandrov. And Whitney came from Princeton. And they all came with definitions of cohomology and with the wonderful fact that the cohomology, as opposed to the homology, has an algebra structure, a ring structure. And they all had formulas. So that's, that's uh, our Kolmogorov and Lewis. This is 1935, though. K41 is six years later, right? And anyway, so, uh, and this, so the idea is to take the Navier Stokes equation, which was written here a little bit in terms of this bracket, and uh, discuss this, these. Entries there, I explained it in terms of cohomology, but that's only here. Let's go back and use Poincaré duality and get it back to homology. That would be two cycles on a three manifold. So you have to intersect three two cycles or three two things 
to get this right hand side of the Navas Euler equation. So that's what Ruth's talk will lead up to. Yeah. So we've been collaborating on this for 20 years, right? More or less. Okay. Okay. Well, it's uh, it's a great honor and pleasure and surprise, I should say, to be here. <laughs> uh, so. <laughs> Indeed. Um, so I will try to continue where where uh, Dennis left off. Okay. So, um, well, uh, we're interested in of a long long term project. Of course, we're interested in discretization. Let me get rid of all these things. Okay. We're interested in discretization of PDEs, for example, Navier Stokes. And as you all know much better than I do, um, there is an annoying nonlinear term or a very useful nonlinear term, depending on how you want to look at it. Um, but uh, so the, the, these equations depend on a function of space and time and derivatives, of course, spatial and time derivatives. Um, if you want to put that on a computer, do numerical simulations, then the first stage, uh, you want to discretize space and you want some form of discretization which preserves the important features of the solution. So instead of thinking of a function of space and time, you would have an ODE evolution in time of a function on lattice points. And the spatial derivative, you can approximate in the simplest form by a divided difference or maybe a symmetric divided difference. Unfortunately, different forms of the uh, continuum equation, for example, these two forms, which are equivalent due to identities, uh, uh, continuum ident identities of, of, of vector analysis operations, do not continue to be equivalent or even have similar behavior uh, when you perform the discretization standard discretization that we wrote here, for example, which means that um, they certainly can't both be right. They can't both be good approximations from the point of view of behavior of solutions to the original system. Okay, so the problem here in this particular case was uh, that you cannot apply uh, vector uh, calculus identities, in particular, what one would say, Leibniz, the derivative of a product is a product of derivatives. So if you discretize, so here I'm just using a one-sided divided difference, then this equality does not hold. On the other hand, there are many other equalities that do hold. Okay, so for example, if you just change the G to G of X plus H, or you change the F, so those would hold, they're not symmetric, but they hold. Or you could not change them, and then you have an error term. Okay, so that's what we want to investigate. Um, if um, we want to do so a little more intelligently just, rather than just talking about functions and uh, finite differences in, in the plain sense, we would like to use ideas of algebraic topology. So going back to our differential equation, instead of thinking of it in terms of a plain function of space and time, we want to think of it in terms of a time-dependent differential form. So the time operator differentiation with respect to time is still as it was, but instead of thinking of arbitrary spatial derivatives, we think of it in terms of the exterior derivative, star operator, and the wedge, which will be giving us this product. Yes. Okay, so from the point of view, as Dennis was just pointing out, of, of uh, um, algebraic topology, um, we have an algebra now of differential forms with this wedge product and the differentiation. So these form what's known as a differential graded algebra, which essentially means that you have these three properties. You have a grading, uh, the product preserves that. In other words, <laughs> P grading, Q grading goes to P plus Q grading, graded commutative, which means there are certain signs that come in. Uh, it's associative and Leibniz. So these are the three properties that we would like to carry over. And if we can keep these three properties in a discrete setting, then we're doing very nicely. Um, unfortunately, um, so I've written these out. Unfortunately, it's an empirical fact that there's no finite dimensional model on cells which preserves homology, so what, what you expect out of the space, and preserves these three properties, commutative, associative, and Leibniz. You have to drop something. 
So if you, you start by subdividing your space into cells, and then you can either go down co-chains or chains. So chains looking at the cells themselves with a boundary operator. And this boundary operator will have degree minus one. The boundary will have dimension one less than what you started with. The square is zero. That is very important. So the basis of algebraic topology. Uh, or you could look at co-chains, essentially functions on the chains. Um, and then you have a co-boundary operator, the dual, and its degree will be plus one and the square will be zero. Okay, so either way, um, our aim is to produce some sort of algebraic structures, and we'll see that there are many different possibilities, which you can think of as a quantization of the spatial algebra, and on which we will place the equation of motion, which I shan't talk about. Um, we want to do it in a way that's suitable for our purposes. So each will start with a finite model, which will lack one of these three properties. Um, and then completes it using an algebraic procedure of adding iteratively corrections. So you end up with some sort of infinity algebra, uh, which equivalent you can think of as a sequence of finite dimensional models, which have error terms because they didn't complete themselves in such a way that all the structures are satisfied. But these error terms are quantitatively estimable uh, and that should help. Okay, so at this point I'll mention Dennis's uh, model or two, two models of the lattice model of hydrodynamics, which was on a bicolored lattice. So that means that whereas the lattice parameter may be H, he's using only chains, that is, uh, linear combinations of cubes of dimension 0, 1, 2, and 3, which are of size 2H. And the nice point about that is that every such cell has a center, which is also in the lattice. And that means it makes it easy to define in a nice way a symmetric product, and also to define the star, so the, the, the dual, which say would take a, a stick to a uh, square cell with a common center in a perpendicular plane. Okay, so these are the two equations, which, well, you might may be more familiar than I am with them. So uh, there's the, the two ways of discretizing, somehow thinking about from where the original equations came, momentum conservation or uh, vorticity model. So this is from the momentum conservation, um, and it's written in terms of differentiating respect to time, of course, and the, uh, well, the basic object is this vector value zero chain. So vector value zero chain means you have a vector at each point, like the velocity. Um, or you could think of it as a vector valued two chain. Well, that's a slightly odd object. So, sorry, this one, coband. Oh, this is the coboundary, yes. Oh, this thing here. Um, well, maybe maybe I made a mistake, but I think this is right. So there's a there's a bracket around it. So this isn't this thing is the vector valued zero chain from a vector valued zero chain. So at each point you have three numbers three functions, and you can instead place them on sticks in the three directions. And that would give you a scalar valued one chain. So that's what this object with the brackets around it is. And then this del of that will be the divergence. So this is just the incompressibility condition. And well, okay, I won't go through all the pieces here. The important part is uh, that here you have multiplication. And for example, star of D would be, would be the uh, vorticity. Okay, so that's one way of writing a model. And another way, this is vorticity dis model discretization. This is in terms of cochains. So the N here would be a, a cochain. And um, so here's the vorticity. From this equation, you can derive that the vorticity moves as it should uh, with the flow. And you can also derive energy conservation. And when you put these on the computer, you find that the, the, although the continuum limits are identical, that the first one blows up rather rapidly and the second one doesn't. Um, and uh, again, that's due to the uh, fact that lightness is Can failing. Sure. So I just want to say that, you know, the joint grant with Israel, you and I, and, yes. and it's useful. These yes, and Daniel N so did a lot of the work on, on yeah, actually yeah, yeah. programming in yeah. Quran. Yes, yes. Okay, so looking at the 
uh, uh, so now what we want to investigate is the algebraic structure of these error terms. Okay, so this is a lattice, and um, we so we understand that we have uh, cells of dimension zero, one, two, and three, which are of size two h. Each one has a center, so you can specify a cell by oops, what happened there? Um, you can, these were supposed to say Z where the blocks appeared. Uh, and it also wasn't supposed to have a two, so generally ignore that. Um, you can specify a cell by its center, which is a point in the lattice, and its type, which will be one of these eight. So in other words, you can have a point, you can have three directions, you can have the three coordinate planes or a cube. But now we see that if we just look at the pieces that are all at the same center, we have this one, three, three, one structure, which is the structure of the exterior algebra of R3, the tangent manifold to our space. Um, okay, so an arbitrary chain you could write as a linear combination of these uh, basic chains. So that means you've really got eight lattice functions. And the operations, well, we have boundary, ordinary geometric boundary, um, and we have wedge which you can define in this way so we're defining the wedge to be operational non-zero only when the two objects share the same center so they don't share the same center even if they're just touching this this particular algebra we will clamp to zero so this is using precisely that exterior algebra structure you can similarly do the same thing on cochains so cochains, we're writing it in the same notation as in differential forms. Uh, we have exactly the same data. The coefficients will, give, will be these eight functions on the scalar functions on the lattice. And operations, again, we can formally do what looks like the same thing, except here I wrote di and here I wrote i. But so what? One difference is, though, that the boundary in the chain case was going down in degree. And in the, in the uh, cochain case, co-boundary is going up in degree. Okay, so try and understand what's going on here. So we just said we have complete the same linear structure, but we will have a very different interaction of the multiplication and the differentiation. And try and understand what's going on. Let's look at the one-dimensional case. So one-dimensional case, we have lattice, uh, like so. We only have here zero cochains and one cochains. If we're looking at cochains, zero cochain is just a function on the lattice points, and a one cochain is a function on the intervals. Well, that's the same data, essentially. Um, remember that intervals now are of length 2h. So again, the h, the x here refers to the, the center point. The, the co-boundary will be given as here. The co-boundary of a one cochain will be zero because the dimension goes up, and of a zero cochain will be a one cochain, namely the object that I've written here. And multiplication, well, you just multiply. Okay, alternatively, you could look at chains. So here you have points, or you have intervals, and uh, this is a general one, and you multiply in the same sort of structure. And the boundary, well, the boundary of a point zero, and the boundary of an edge is just the difference in points. Okay, so things look fairly similar in the two two sides, except as I said, that while the multiplication is on degrees additive, so it's always going up, uh, the boundary is going in different directions. What's, what's the G in the bottom corner? Yes. The delta of F. Yes, so I've got two, I'm just putting the two together. So instead of thinking of zero chains and one chain separately, I'm writing a general chain, which may have point components and it may have so the point components are given by this function f, and the, the the one sticks are given by the sticks are given by the function g. Is zero? Is that what I'm supposed to take? No, it's not. These are the forms, and these are literally the sticks. So the boundary of a point is zero, yes, but the boundary of a stick has is the difference of two points. So the f del whoopsie, um, that's the problem. You staying in here. Yes. Delta yes. Delta. Ah, yes. So here is delta, which is the, the code. That's, yes, that, that's more like the boundary operator in your sense of, of differential forms. And here we're looking at the boundary in geometric sense. You now you have a three-dimensional body. It's boundary is the surface. You have a stake. The boundary is just the two points, difference in two points. So that's what I've got here. So here I've got no nothing in the boundary coming from F because they were points. And I've got something coming from the XA because it's the difference of these two points, which I can just sum in like that. Okay. So um, 
and one should think of this uh, as comparing with the continuum. If you divide this one by 2h or that one by 2h, then that should go back in the case where h is going to zero and capital N is going uh, to infinity. Um, you, in such a way, the product is constant. That this should be approximating the, the derivative. Either way, oops. Okay, so, um, so in this one-dimensional case, what is the error from Leibniz? So this is slightly different from the calculation I wrote before because I'm using the symmetric derivative now. But still, you have an error, and the error can be written now. You need the sum of two products of terms. But the important point is that you can take out this factor of h. So the error can be explicitly written, and and of course we'll go to zero as h goes to zero. Okay, now as a general theory of these things, uh, so you have commutative and associative and no Leibniz. So we have a graded vector space, we have a commutative associative multiplication, and we have a D, which doesn't satisfy Leibniz, but is, of course, of square zero and grading plus or minus one. What can you do? Well, you want to analyze the structure of these errors. And we'll do that by what, what are called higher infinitesimal cumulants. So the first one is not an error, it's just D itself. D1 will be D itself. It's a map from A to A. D2 will be the error from Leibniz. So it'll be the difference of these two sides. This is D2. And it's now a function of both A and B. You can think of it as a map from symmetric power S2A to A. So this is the first cumulant. And you can also think of it as the commutator of D and multiplication. D3 is uh, some of seven terms. Well, there are some signs here. So there are, you take the D of the product and you take minus terms with D of pair multiplied by the third one. And then there are some extra, extra signs, causal signs that come in here. And then plus D of a single one multiplied by the other two. And you don't have the eighth term because we have no unit in this algebra. So, so the number of terms in Dn will be two to the n minus one. Okay, so uh, this, if it vanished, would be the so-called seven term relation. And we would have a BV algebra. So you can think of the second cumulant as giving you the error from the BV algebra. And indeed, if the first cumulant is zero, then the second one will also be zero because you can write this D3 in terms of D2. And that's always true. OK, so then you can carry on formally and uh, you produce an infinite sequence of these things. And in order to understand this better, so these, these objects are maps on different spaces. They're maps on symmetric spaces, S, K, A to A. And we want to somehow put these together. In order to do that, the symmetric power, case symmetric power of the algebra space, eh? on the grade space. Eh? Yes. Ah, oh, yes, you're right. Well, no, so it's, here it's disappeared. So the, the multiplication, which was in the previous slide, the wedge, is now written as M. Oh, that's nothing to do with it. That's a formal object inside SKA. So instead of saying, I could have said it's just a function of A and B. But it's a, B. yes, I'm defining, instead of saying A comma B, because I'm put, remembering the symmetry, symmetry properties here, it's not symmetric, symmetric with a sign, so I'm writing as A wedge B. So it's a, it's a function, yes, that's an element of S2A. The, the dot shouldn't just be wedge everywhere. No, no, this dot here is M. On the left hand, I'm defined, this is a definition of a map from S2A to A. Okay, in other words, what's an element of S2A? Well, it's A wedge B. A wedge B meaning the pair A and B, but I'm identifying, well, I take a combination, or you're identifying A comma B and B comma A with a certain signs. Okay, on the right-hand side, this dot means use the multiplication in the algebra. So this is really, everything on the right-hand side is just ordinary world of A. Take the product, take D of it. And it gets messy to write M everywhere. So although I wrote M here, I just write dot here. <laughs> okay. So, um, okay. So it's an important structure, this co-algebra structure. As you have an algebra structure that multiplies, you have a co-algebra structure which maps something to it across itself. So this is an internal structure inside anything where you're taking a symmetric power. It has nothing to do with this M. This is how it's given. 
Okay, so if you have one object which is a wedge, it's going to map it to a linear combination of pairs of objects with wedges. Okay, uh, you doesn't you don't really need to follow that carefully. Um, the important point is that the coalgebra structure defines notions of a coalgebra map, something that preserves a structure and co-derivation, just as an algebra structure would define notions of an algebra map and a derivation. And these will all be maps on this big object now, S star A. It also allows any map from S star A to A to be extended uniquely either to a coalgebra map, which I didn't write down here, or to a co-derivation. And why would we do all this? Because that's exactly what we want to do. We want to take these DKs, these high infinitesimal cumulants, and we want to extend them all to co-derivations. And then they'll all be in the same place and we can add them. So let's see what we get. So these are the maps as we have them, the high infinitesimal cumulants. And now you can push them all up to the same world. So I'm saying how they act here, here they act as zero, well, so D1, for example, acted as DA. If it's acting on a pair of elements, well, you just act on one at a time. Acting on a triple again, you act on one at a time. D2 is naturally acting on a pair of elements. If you try and give it only one, it can only give you zero. If you act on a triple, you act on all pairs and add. So this is what you get. And so on, D3 acts initially on. So we have this, this triangular structure. Okay, what's nice is if you add them up, then you get a big D, which is a map from S star to itself, and it has square zero. And of course it has the same grading as the original differential. And it has the same first, these first two terms, one is essentially D, and the other is the error from Leibniz, this bracket of D and F. So you can think of it the other way around. You can think of uh, that we have a D, which we've extended to this D, D wedge, which has square zero. We have this bracket of D with M, which is the error from Leibniz, which we call D2, and push it up so it is. You can compare the two maps and you can take their commutator. That commutator is zero also, this is the reason. Um, and you can then ask the question, well, this square has zero, these two commute. So if D2 squared was also zero, then D1 plus D2 would have square zero. In algebraic topology, we always like things that have D's that have square zero. Without that, we can't start. Okay, so we had one in the, in the beginning, namely D itself, but we wanted to get M involved, and we, we understand that D and M do not commute. So, so this is the next, this error, this first cumulant is, is the next object we want to evolve. So we want to start with D, we want to have D and M, and then we want to somehow correct the problem that D2 was not of square zero. So the question is, what corrections can we add in order to get square zero? And the answer is, well, I just told you the answer. The answer is we take all the D3, D4s and so on. Um, so now to understand why that's so, the seven term expression is D3, yes, is the, is the first correction is that seven term expression, correct. Okay, so what is the, now the beautiful reason for this is that somehow if you do a correct change of variables, which is this, cumulant bijection, which has a very nice structure, but I don't want to go into too much detail there, then you can think of the D as just a change of coordinates version of the original D. So of course, if it's conjugate to the original D, the original D had square zero, then this will also have square zero. Okay, so, um, so we have, then you can apply this general theory to our particular case, which uh, of, of the, the lattice with, well, we've got two cases. We've got the co-chain model and we've got the chain model. And you can ask, what are these higher infinitesimal cumulants? So remember, high infinitesimal cumulant takes a k-tuple of co-chains and gives out a co-chain. And the answer is that it's divisible by h to the k minus one. In other words, you can write it in an explicit way is h to the k minus one times the sum of certain products of divided differences of the coefficients in these co-chains. On the other hand, get very different behavior from the other side using chains. If you use chains, then the power here is h to the k minus two. So what does that mean? Well, if we go back when h goes to zero, so d1, you normalize it in this way, then as we said, we just get the ordinary continuum derivative. d2, you've already got a factor of h here. So d2 goes to zero. What does that mean? d2 was the error from Leibniz, so Leibniz is satisfied. So it's telling you that the structure approaches a differential graded algebra, what was into differential forms. 
So in, in which sense is this a, what is it, it's a constraint in D1? Uh, D, no, D1 is, oh, just in the ordinary sense. I mean, you have a divided difference, and so as H goes to zero, it goes to the derivative. Yes, as it operates on, on the objects, it operates on, yes. The chains, on the other hand, you have this K minus two. So uh, D2 is not, does not go to zero. D2, we don't have a power of, of H to take out. What is it? Well, it's the Lee bracket on vector fields or the Shatton and House bracket on polyvector fields. On the other hand, D3, does have a factor of H here, does go to zero. So with seven term relation hold, we have a BV algebra. So what is this? This is the structure approaching the BV algebra of polyvector fields. Okay, um, in addition to that, you have very nice structures, but when you, some sort of renormalization map, when you change the scale, so you subdivide. You are ruthless. <laughs> well, <laughs> I have to get somewhere. <laughs> I haven't got your triple bracket yet, so it's going to take a bit of that. Okay, um, so I, I will tell you briefly about this. If you have a chain, so you think of it one of those bricks or a combination of those bricks, the brick you can break down into eight sub bricks. So that is this crumbling map. Or co chains in the reverse direction, co chains basically you're talking about functions, and you can integrate average however you want to look at it. So you have maps that connect these structures. These are chain maps, meaning that they protect, preserve the boundary, but they do not behave well with respect to the multiplication because the average of a product is not the product of the averages. So what do you get? Well, okay, so there's some geometric, some nice cube here structure, but what it, it tells you in the end is that there is a way of taking the crumbling map or integration map getting some structure out of it, this thing called the sigma, which in fact happened to be the commutative cumulants. So for example, the first one would be the difference of these two terms, and then there'll be higher and higher versions of that, just in the same way that we had infinitesimal uh, cumulants when we were dealing with the DKs. And these things will, you put them together, will intertwine between the, the big D and the big D bar. So these structures, the error, structures of the error terms all fit together very nicely perfectly um, under its renormalization map. And in our particular case, again, you can compute uh, exactly what this is. You have in the case of the lattice, and you find uh, that certain divisibility properties by, in this case, in both cases, by h to the k minus one. Okay, um, so I think at this point, I think I'll skip, unless you object, I'll skip all the part in the middle to do with, in the case when you do have Leibniz. So Leib having Leibniz is what one traditionally has in the uh, algebraic topology setup. It's very unusual to have commutativity and associativity in no Leibniz and still have some interesting structure. When you do have Leibniz, well, then you're going to have to drop one or other of commutativity or associativity. So, um, so point-wise, you have no trouble, you just multiply. But when you start doing it with uh, some extensive uh, some one code chain for example which exists on a on a uh, on a stick then um apart from in the case where we're just dealing with where we can talk about the middle and then you can multiply at the center points if you don't have a center point you're going to have to choose one way or the other whether you're multiplying on the left or you're multiplying on the right and this is related to the problem of cellular approximation to the diagonal um, and you have two ways of doing it. This is the Alexander Whitney cup product. Um, but either way, you'll have a non commutative associative Leibniz, which you could average to get commutative. And since Leibniz is a linear property, it will still be retained. But by, once you've averaged, then you no longer have associativity. So you're going to have to choose one way or the other. Um, so then we have the three possibilities. The first one is the one we just talked about, writing the one-dimensional situation. We have commutative associative and not Leibniz. And the other ones are where you're dropping out the commutativity or associativity. This is M, M prime, and M double prime. Okay, so... Um, so uh, is that an actual theorem that may be possible for those three properties? Yes. <laughs> So this M double prime here, um, you can also think of, because it's still commutative, 
you can think of it if you're thinking on on chain so we're working on co-chain so if you take the dual work on chain so now you have a co-product since it was commutative or graded commutative it's now going to be graded co-commutative so instead of just thinking of it as mapping to c cross c you know, you can think of it as mapping into this Lie bracket and then you get into differential graded Lie algebras and i'll just mention the first one because dennis wanted me to um well, yes so you can just throw them in you can just formally say okay so say i had a an interval interval has two endpoints and something in the middle so i'll make a free Lie algebra on three generators those three objects and everything is nice until we want to put a differential structure then we will insist that with the grading you have to be careful about you shift by one uh we would like the not the part of the boundary which doesn't have brackets to be the geometric boundary well we haven't got much geometric boundary here we've just got two points which have boundary zero and an edge which has boundary which is the difference of points on points we then say well we would like this funny condition to be satisfied so that's more a Cartan condition um I don't tell you where that came from. And then it's proved that this can always, there is a procedure for doing this. This can always be done locally. Uh, and his proof was iterative on dimension and on cells one at a time because we have, we have a local D, such a way that D squared is zero. And you have to start with a D whose square is zero, namely the geometric boundary and a chain map. And the chain map you're going to use is this M double prime I talked about in the previous slides. Okay, so just to give you something that these things exist, in the case of the interval, it's unique. There's only one way of adding further terms. This is the one way. So it starts B minus A, of course, we just said that. And then you have to add them in some way. And the way you have to add them has these but newly number coefficients. So there's actually a beautiful explanation for it, which is that if you think of this gauge flow equation, then that is the, the expression we gave is the unique expression which will flow from A to B in unit time. And if you solve that for what is this DE, you'll find it's this thing. Okay, so at that point, I think I am going to, yes, and then, oh, and then there is a subdivision map in this case, everything was nonlinear. Uh, the subdivision map turns out to be the Camp Baker Campbell Hausdorff formula. Um, okay, so then you can, sorry. Oh, here, so we've got an interval with edge with, with edge A, e, with vertices A and B, and it's now got, we've got two intervals, okay? So you map A to A0, B to A2, and E for something which has to be a function of E1 and E2, but it has to have the right grading, so all you can do is take E1 plus E2 and then add corrections, and this is the only one that will that. Okay, so you could do this, as we said, you could do it for any uh, cell complex, TW complex, um, and so with my students, I produced various nice symmetric explicit models. Various, excuse me. Oh, it's thinking. Sorry. Okay, yes. Um, so this two dimension, three dimension, all sorts of nice stories. Okay, so now I want to talk about what Dennis wanted, uh, triple form. So I'm going to give you something that is commutative, associative, and Leibniz. You're supposed oh. to, yes. <laughs> of course, there has to be a rub somewhere. Um, so this will be based on transverse intersection. It only will take into account zero, one, and two dimensions. I mean, we're in three dimensions, but we won't have the three chains. So the structure will be on zero cells, uh, it'll be on the same lattice. It'll be on zero cells, which are points. One cells, now we have to extend them a bit. So there will be the two H cells, but also we're going to be allow sticks of length H. And we're even going to allow sticks of length zero, but they will have a direction to them. Okay, so these are nine types here on the lattice. And in C2 will be squares, two H squares, uh, parallel to the coordinate planes. So that is our basis for C. The grading is by co-dimension. Okay, so although we're writing chains, in some sense, we're thinking about co-chains. Um, so in other words, the point will be graded three, the sticks will be graded two, and this will be graded one. What, what, for what purpose is the grading matter? Only in the signs. And of course, three minus changes the parity. So it's very important whether you're dealing with uh, the, the dimension or co-dimension. 
And the boundary, so these are the, the dimensions, the boundary, well, points have zero boundary, edges have boundary as you expect, the boundary of a stick is a difference, the boundary of an infinitesimal object is zero, and the boundary of a square is what you expect it to be, the four sides. Then there will be a product. Okay, so you remember that the product has to uh, preserve the additive on the dimension. But now remember, the dimension is co-dimension. So the only ones that are non-zero here, we've got three, two, and one. The only ones that are going to be non-zero are if we take C2 cross C2 to C1 or C2 cross C1 to C0. So what's C2 cross C2? We're taking two elementary squares. In order to get a non-zero answer, they have to, in, the closures have to actually intersect geometrically and they must be in orthogonal directions so that they are transverse. And the intersection will be the geometric intersection, which will be a stick of length 2H, H or zero. In these cases, you can see here. Um, it will have a sign, which is given by the vector product of the normal directions. And it will have a power of a half coming from what I call here boundary cases. So here, there's no power of a half because it's somehow, whoops, it's somehow generic. Um, but here, there's a boundary. These all have a half. And on the right-hand picture here, you've even got a quarter. So it's intersecting on an edge, which is on the boundary of both of these squares. So you have a factor of a quarter. Okay, so that's the bound. This is a product from C2 cross C2 to C1. From, then you've got C1 cross C1 to C0. So what does that mean? Basis elements, you have a square and an interval, a stick. Okay, so again, it's only going to be non-zero when there is a geometric intersection and it's transverse. The geometric intersection will be a point. So all I have to tell you is the weightings. So I've just written two of them here. There are actually four cases. Okay, the nice thing is if you do it correctly, it works, meaning you have commutativity, associativity, and Leibniz. Um, well, oh, so for some reason it decided uh, on this computer not to type these things. So here, this was supposed to be a Q, rational numbers. So we, in, in we give you an extra map, which is on C0, it's linear combination of points. We can count the points, or if there are weightings there, you just add them up. What's that for? Because now we want to give what Dennis was wanting, the linking form and the triple form. So the linking form is going to be this thing. You take A, you multiply it by the boundary of B, and you count the points. You just want a number coming out of it. This defines a symmetric map from C2 cross C2 to Q which depends only, so A and B here were elements of C2, but it actually depends only on the boundaries and that's the boundaries will be these closed curves. So any closed curve, you can think of the boundary of something then you can write that expression down and it will be symmetric. Why is it symmetric? So we have to show that this difference is zero. To work out this difference, well, first I'm gonna change the order here. And because you see A and B, were two-dimensional objects, which means that the grading was one. Okay, so actually we can change the sign round here. So, and this, yes, this is actually the boundary of a product. Okay, so that's why this sign here, this minus this, it should have a minus one to the power of the grading of, of, of A, but the grading of A was one. So that's why you get this minus sign. So you've got the, the number operator applied to a boundary. Okay. Boundary of any stick is a difference of two points. The number operator is zero, so it's zero. Okay, so I've used commutativity and Leibniz to see why you have a linking form being symmetric. Okay, triple intersection form. Well, this is what I've written down. It just, you take the product and then you take another product and then you apply this, give you a map from C2 cross C2 cross C2 to Q, which is alternating. And there I've used associativity. So I've used all the three parts here to, see, to show you just what that triple intersection form looks like. So here it's assuming that they're all going to be orthogonal intersecting. So that's a nice case. You get a factor of one. And this is, whoops, where they were somewhere else and you get a factor of one over 64. So you're really using these fractions. Okay, so that's what I promised. And uh, so here it just says that, well, we're, that's the algebra part. Now you have to put on the uh, equation of motion. Um, and thank you. That's my part.